Hello and welcome to Nearsoft's Dojo Live season finale. Um, my name is Kim Lantis. I'll be hosting today as Carlos Ponce is on vacation. We apologize um, for the late start. We had a couple microphone details, but thank you for your patience. Um, joined today by Nearsoft COO Matt Perez, as well as fellow Nearsoftian um, Java developer Clemo. And our guest of honor, um, Yossi Ginsberg, who is author, adventurer, and entrepreneur. Thank you for joining us, Yossi. It's a great pleasure. Thank you for having me. No, really, the pleasure is ours. Um, so for those of you um, who are, are joining us, uh, Yossi chose the title of his talk today to be Bringing Amazon Survival um, Skills to Business. Now, to clarify, we're not talking about Amazon.com. We're talking about the actual Amazon rainforest. Um, Yossi has a very interesting um, life story to share with us and then how that um, applies to um, just his life in general, what he's learned, how he applies those skills to business as an entrepreneur. Um, so uh, Yossi, I guess we can start by you sharing um, that experience with us and then we'll see um, how we go from there. Okay, I'll try to be very brief about it. So, um, at a young age, driven by dreams, I think will be the first link to entrepreneurship because uh, um, having a dream and being obsessed with a dream is the basic uh, virtue of every entrepreneur. And, and I would say also that being naive enough to believe that you can achieve the dream is also essential because a lot of dreamers just keep dreaming and never dare to go after the dream. So my dream was to be a great explorer and go deep into the uncharted, find the tribes that were never explored before, marry the daughter of the chief and finding treasures in the forest, becoming rich and famous as well. So this was my dream. But I was serious about it, so I decided I'm going to do it. And my father wasn't really approving, <laughs> so his only way um, to prevent me was saying he, he will not support me uh, at all. So um, I had to work for my dream, which is another good point. Uh, you know, dreams cost, they cost a lot. So first of all, I worked for like six months in construction, initially in Israel, then I managed to fly out of Israel to Norway in fierce freezing cold I worked. Then I went all the way to Alaska and worked the season in Alaska in, in canneries and fishing and in restaurant and shipping boats. And then some adversity struck. A friend came to Alaska and convinced me to just have a little bit of R&R &R and just have some fun and drive a little bit and enjoy. So I did. And getting to Las Vegas, I lost all my money in one night. <laughs> and this I'm talking about like eight months of hard work, all for my dream. And now I lost everything and I was literally penniless. And I tell it because it's important for entrepreneurs to know that there's always good reasons to quit. Yeah? You had a dream and you did everything right and you went for it, but then something happened. Something always happened. There's always then. And you have to know that this is part of the process. And for me, the dream was bigger than that adversity. Um, I went to New York, spent another four, four months loading and loading trucks, sleeping in the backs of the trucks to, not to spend money on hotels. And in the end, I managed to have enough money and fly to South America in search of my dream. Um, I traveled in South America for like six, seven months and always looking for the rainforest uh, deep in the, in the Amazon, um, in Venezuela, in Colombia, in Ecuador, in Peru. And I didn't find my lost tribe. And the tribes I found, they weren't lost. They were found years before by missionaries. <laughs> and 
So I thought in the end maybe the time of great adventure is over. Maybe the world is already explored. And I was a bit disappointed. So I had the time of my life as a backpacker, of course. Then in Bolivia, on the border of Bolivia, I met a friend that became very dear to me and we started traveling together. He was a Swiss school teacher on sabbatical. Then in the streets of La Paz, suddenly a man approached me and started talking to me. He was a stranger. He wasn't a backpacker, so I had like some resistance because, you know, he was... I didn't know what he wanted, but a few minutes later I realized it's all happening. This is the man for my dream. He introduced himself as an Austrian geologist. He said he's going into the Uncharted. He said he makes contact with indigenous people because they're the best, shortest, and most efficient way to the treasure that he's looking for. In short, he was speaking to me as if he read my dreams in my head. He was inside my head. I couldn't but follow him. Um, another friend um, appeared in La Paz, and we became a foursome. An Austrian geologist as our guide, me an Israeli, and the two friends were an American and a Swiss. Uh, it's a big story, so I'll just cut it very short. For a month, we left civilization and walked deep, deep into the uncharted Bolivian Amazon. Uh, and, and it was the beginning of the uh, rainy season. We didn't have food, so we were hunting, and um, the situation was quite extreme, uh, physically walking day and night and getting wet and rushes and blisters, and the relationship started uh, breaking up. And after about a month, we still didn't make it to this uh, tribe and um, we decided to try and evacuate because one of us was already um, injured. He had like a, some kind of uh, fungal infection and his feet um, were in, in pretty grave situation. At that time, we tried to build a raft and evacuate on the raft. But on the raft, things got only worse because our guide, our amazing guide, couldn't swim. So on the raft, he lost his power, and we started fighting. In short, we did something that we'll, I guess we'll regret forever. And we split in the middle of the Uncharted. The guy decided to walk back through the jungle, leave the raft. He said it's too dangerous. And me and the American guy, Kevin, decided we're not going to listen to him, and we're going to stick to the river and take the raft down river. But uh, we didn't want our friend, the Swiss guy, to join us. We thought it would be better for him to go out with the guy. They never came back. The Austrian and the Swiss were never seen again. Um, we have to live with it. Um, me and Kevin, the American, we kept on on the river for three hours until we hit uh, a canyon, a narrow canyon, waterfalls, rapids, and we lost each other. The raft broke, and we lost each other, each other in the river. And half an hour later, when by miracle, I, I survived all the rapids and, 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 and this canyon, and I managed to drag myself out of the river. Uh -oh. My friends, I was alone in the midst of the rainy season, with no fire, no gun, no food, nothing. And for three weeks, I walked alone in this forest. Um, These three weeks were very transformational. Initially, I was sure I, I, I wouldn't be able to handle it. And my only hope was uh, to find my friend. And for a few days, I was just walking along the river, waiting for him, looking for him, screaming. But after four days of trying to find him, I realized something must have happened, and I'm alone. At that point, I, I, I started walking down river. And it's a big story, but there was a process of self-discovery. And that's where the essence of my teaching, first of all, my insights, I would say, to the level of enlightenment. 
enlightenment not in the sense of you know I'm a spiritual enlightenment but in the sense of big ideas were revealed to me big um, insights uh, were internalized and like the light go went on and I'm happy to share some of those insights but one of them which is amazing is that actually survival feels great and um, that actually I never felt so good despite the tremendous hardship um, I never felt so good in my life I never belonged I never so, so much as I belong there and for the first time in my life I was in the center of things there was nobody else I, I realized I can rely on myself I realized I have the wisdom I realized I have the power and I know what to do and it was really an awakening and I think this awakening is due to each one of us and because it's not about me it's about my discovery it's something that is coming to all of us and uh, but I made other discoveries as well and I'll, I'll be happy to share but just to close that story is for 20 days I walked in the river uh, huge adventures storms and animals and floods and, and 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 swamps and fire ants and jaguars and deadly snakes and nothing to eat and and you know um, there's amazing stories of miracles that happen uh, during this time that as far as I'm concerned um, they were so urgent that were they were not even covered they were even clear miracles for example one of the miracles just to give you a sense of it is after 17 days an airplane passed in the sky this was my lowest moment actually what ho what killed me was the hope uh, for 17 days I could rely on whatever came I was strong but when this airplane passed for a minute a surge of hope uh, went through me and I thought that if I managed to mark to that airplane I'll be saved when the airplane passed and you know oblivious of me I broke down that surge of hope was too much to bear at that moment when I gave up suddenly um, I heard the cry in the bush and when I looked there was a girl hiding in the bush and she was crying there and I ran to her and I started screaming at her you know like you know you don't have time to waste and stop crying because the airplane may come back and I grabbed her by the hand and for two days I just constantly talked to this girl I helped her I did everything I could to support her only two nights later when I made a place for her to sleep next to me I made a shelter for her I called her to come closer to me so we can withdraw warmth from each other and I realized there's no, there was nobody there but for two days she was there with me now if this was imagination I still wonder whose imagination was it because <laughs> I didn't make it up so if she wasn't real then who made it made her up and also the amazing you know life-changing insight that when I didn't have any power to help myself anymore the moment there was somebody else that needed me I did find the power that actually we have more power when we give it to others when we serve others we are more powerful than we just self-centered so all this was not you know it's just what's happening and the most amazing thing is that on the 20th night um, a, a boat landed where I collapsed now this by itself was a miracle this boat was searching for me for three days and they stopped on that shore to turn and go back in fact they already turned the boat I was thinking it's a wasp or a bee hearing that noise of the motor and when finally I raised my head they were already pushing the boat down river it was Kevin uh, my friends that came back with the indigenous people that found him in the river 
and they saved my life. Mm -hmm. um, so this is like my first Amazonian adventure. The second one was 10 years later when I came back and lived on the same river, on that same river that almost claimed my life. I, I went to visit the indigenous community and, and the Takanas of San Jose de Uchupiamona and when they told me that they're dying because in their remote uh, seclusion the youth doesn't want to continue living like the ancestors and they're leaving the village one after the other and not, not coming back mm -hmm. which means their village is dying they told me they have also a solution to the problem and which was so far-fetched they said they'll build a resort and with this resort the youth will be able to gain to make money without leaving the forest and take some pride also in their culture and and it was such a far-fetched idea to build a resort in such a remote place with no roads with no flights but anyway I didn't have a better idea so I said uh, it's a great idea and I moved there and I lived with them for three years on the bank on that same river and that's where my big enlightenment came by actually not being um, lost and in a desperate situation but actually living with people that are Amazonian and that know the forest and live in perfect harmony with it and the insights that I gained from that are also life-changing so I, I would say that for me Amazon Survival Skills for Business is two sets of tools one that I gained through surviving against all odds in an extreme situation and second set of tools is actually from living in the forest with the people that um, are um, indigenous um, to this part of the world and I deciphered some great secrets and I'm happy to share these with you. Perfect. Josie, I understand that for those of our viewers who wish to know more about both stories, both your um, adventures while you were lost in the jungle as well as what you learned from that, you do have two books available, is that right? That's right, I have two books. And I have two movies. There's a Discovery Channel documentary called I Shouldn't Be Alive, Escape from the Amazon. Okay. And there's a movie coming soon in January 2017 starring Daniel Radcliffe, also known as Harry Potter. Right. <laughs> uh, this, uh, uh, this movie is coming in January. The title will be Jungle. My books, I have two books. One is called Jungle, which is the original story. And the other, called, the other is called The Laws of the Jungle, which is my insights uh, after my second visit. Perfect. And the name of the Eco Lodge that um, you helped establish in Bolivia? It's called Chalalan. Chalalan. C-H-A-L-A-L-A-N. Okay. You just go to chalalan.com and it will all come to life. Perfect. Um, what's the meaning behind Chalalan? It's just, uh, it just a name. Um, it's just the noise of the river as it hits the rock, the rapids near that location. Um, actually, it's a name I gave the, 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 the Echo Lodge. My fellow brothers, the Takanas, they wanted to call it San Antonio. <laughs> I said, you know, because the local, that curve in the river, is you know because of the rapids it's called Chalalan mm -hmm. I said why don't we call it Chalalan and I'm happy they agreed perfect um, before we get started with um, your um, business applications you have from your survival experience um, Clement, Matt do you have any questions for Yossi? Just, just a comment that uh, Chalalan is a better name than Antonio <laughs> I agree. Um, do you um, do you keep that passion for uh, uh, the rainforest? Uh, for instance, where do you live now? Okay, um, I have two houses. One of my houses is in the rainforest in Australia. Um, I have uh, about thirty acres of pristine primal forest. It's a subtropical rainforest in the Byron Shire. Eastern Australia. It's amazing. Uh, when I go home there, 
I have to cross the river 11 times just to come home. It's through causeways. So I have to go in with drive with my car inside the water and out 11 times just to get home. So just to come home, it's an adventure. And I lived there for seven years, and I was addicted just to that beauty, to that pristine uh, beauty of nature. It still has a huge impact on me. My other house, where I'm calling you from, is actually on the shore of the Mediterranean, but I mean first line to the shore. When I leave the house right here, I go to the back, and I'm on a sand dune. So nature, earth, is extremely important in my life. There's not a day that I don't put my hands inside the earth. Um, usually it's the first thing that I do in the morning. I wake up, I go outside. Uh, I love nature. Uh, as you'll hear, my biggest insight is nature. And the blueprint for everything is nature. It's perfection. And I just think that nature also teaches us so much about business. And I'm very passionate about that as well because I think uh, business is very important. And in the context of nature, it's very, very important because nature means, uh, you know, abundance and that everything is provided for us. But we cannot be hunters, gatherers, you know. Life has changed on this planet. And we cannot be hunter-gatherers. And that's why business is hunting and gathering. But we just have to apply natural principles to business. And this is what the Amazon can teach us more than any part of the world. And the reason for this is there's no fiercer competition than in the Amazon. Because the Amazon is only 4% of the planet. But the Amazon is home for 50% of all species. So the biggest wow. pressure of population on resources is in the Amazon. And that's why Amazon is the best teacher. And I'll, I'm happy to share the teaching with you. Yes, um, please do. I'm assuming this has something to do. I've read about you have something called the Weevolution Revolution. Is that right? Yes, yes. Well, um, so, you know, like the most amazing discovery is, you know, uh, is that actually competition and the fiercest the competition, actually, the better we are, okay? So competition is a very good thing. Now, this is so obvious. It is so in our face. Now, more than ever, because the Olympics are on. Okay? So you see that the competition is the fiercest. All the world records are broken. Why aren't they broken all year round? Because the competition is not intense enough. The more competition, the better we become. So that's the first thing. We associate competition with something negative with somebody going down, with, in the Olympics, nobody's going down. You know why? Because the one that wins the gold medal would never win, won it if the other best seven wouldn't chase him in the finals to push him to break the record. It would never be the best without the other seven. Now, the eighth one, the one that arrives last, broke his personal record, is still the best that he can be or she can be. The Olympic is a great example of no losers, only winners. If you are the best that you can be, you cannot, you cannot be called a loser. Nobody loses. Everybody wins. Everybody becomes at the top of their game. And this is exactly what happens in competition. So in the rainforest, um, this is the fierce competition because it's like the densest place on the planet. You know what's going on? Yes. All the species in the rainforest are in a state of peak performance, just like athletes at the Olympics. Naturally, because of competition, you become at peak performance. What does it mean to be at peak performance? Well, for a plant, it means secondary metabolism. 
okay? The secondary metabolism of a plant, it's all the survival mechanism, it's all the protection, it's all the um, defense and, 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 and feeding and defending, okay? So the science of taxonomy shows us that if you take two plants that are identical, one is living in the rainforest and the same plant living outside the rainforest, the plant in the rainforest is at least double the potency than is sibling outside of the forest. So same, because of competition, you become better. You become at your peak performance. Okay, you cannot afford not to be in there. But that's another thing very interesting. When you are in a peak performance, nothing feels better. Yeah? Nothing feels better. You know, we all want to be in peak performance. So actually, all we associate competition with something that is bad, that is a struggle, that is an effort. Actually, it's a natural state that drives us to be the best that we can be. When we are the best that we can be, we are also the happiest. We are the most productive when we are the best that we can be. We are at peak performance. For humans, what peak performance means is two things. First of all, all faculties come together. And second, they come together to focus on one clear purpose. That's peak performance. So physical, mental, and spiritual honed and consolidated and focused on one purpose. That's peak performance. Physically, all the muscles, all the hormones, they push you to be the best. Mentally, clarity, stability, no worries, um, no stress. Why no worries? Why no fear? Why no stress? Because they counter effective to peak performance. They counter effective. In peak performance, you don't even have, you don't need a process to drive you there. It happens naturally. Because of that competition, these things are happening naturally. So this is the big, amazing enlightenment. Competition makes you the best that you can be. It's a good thing. Yeah? But then come the other part, which is very, very interesting. Okay, so we talk about the secret of survival. Let's again go first to the animal and then to, you, to, to the human, okay? The animal is at a bit higher place spiritually than the human, I think because the animal is not separated from the vibration of the universe. Our mind separates us. We're not listening. It's going through us, but we're not receiving. The animals do receive. Have you noticed that people die in tsunamis and earthquakes, but animals evacuate in time? <laughs> How come? They know, they listen to the universe, they get the vibration, they're not wiser, they're just more connected, you know? Our mind separates us, okay? So in a sense, animals, they're just nature. Humanity is also nature, but nature that thinks that it's not nature, yeah? That's the problem, okay. So, the animal, in the, in the analogy that we look at the animal survival, we look, it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing to see. We go back to the rainforest. You would think that it's the toughest place to survive. Because what does survival mean? Survival means fight over resources. Yeah? You need to survive. Why fight? There's a reason why to fight. Because we are taught that markets are limited. In other words, we are taught that the world is a world of scarcity. We are taught that the population is bigger than the resources. So there's not enough resources for all of us, and that's why we need to fight. Who is the father of this philosophy? Darwin. And what is the title of Darwin's canonic book. The title is The Origin of Species. What is the subtitle of this book? The subtitle of this book is Our Preferred Species Survive in the Struggle for Life. And that's why I call Darwin a con artist. 
am very, very upset with the teachings of Darwin. Darwin is saying that life is a struggle and that in this struggle only certain species will survive. Yeah? That's very dangerous ideas. Because it's saying there's not enough for all of us and because there's not en enough for all of us we have to fight for it. And when we fight for it only certain will species will survive, the others will perish. This is so wrong. This is so dangerous. Uh, this is so racist to say that there are preferred species that are predisposed for survival while others are lesser species. They're not preferred. Yeah? And it's wrong. Scientifically it's wrong. And the principle of survival as Darwin is saying, which is adaptation, is not depending on the species. A cell will adapt to the environment. It doesn't even have to be a species. So, I'm saying this thought is the dangerous thing. This thought that we live in a world of scarcity and because of that we have to fight each other. Competition became the highest value in our societies but the way we perceive competition is not in the Olympic sense where there's only winners. In our perception of competition somebody has to go down because there's not enough for me and you so you have to go down. If I'm a, you know, um, a software company and, or I'm a, a, a shoemaker or I'm a soft drink maker I have to kill the competition, I have to outsmart the competition, I have to outfox the competition. It's all about doing what the competition is not willing to do. It's all... So, I'll tell you this is very inefficient. So let's get, let's get back to real survival and go back to the Amazon and see what real survival is. Peak performance, which is the situation that is needed for peak survival, is all about clear focus on one target and then the utmost efficiency to get there. Survival is about efficiency. You don't waste energy. I tell you, I know this personally. When I was alone in, in, in the forest, I knew, not even, I, I didn't have to work on it. Anything that works against the goal is dangerous because you spend energy on something that doesn't bring you um, to your goal. So. Everything has to be consolidated, focused, laser focused on one thing. It has to be efficient. No energy is wasted. So if the analogy is I'm in the, in the jungle and I'm a monkey, I want to get to the fruit. And that's my survival. I need food. But now if there's another monkey on the tree, um, I have to fight that monkey. So what is happening if I fight that monkey because both of us wants to get to the fruit? Both of us don't get the fruit, but we waste a lot of energy fighting each other instead of getting the fruit. That's it's, that this is not a smart strategy because I'm not actually getting, I'm not focusing on my target. I'm focusing on what stands between me and my target and I'm wasting all my energy on a fight. Now, fight, by the way, takes all the peak performance away. It's full of fear and stress and worry and it actually takes you away from that state of peak performance. So what an animal does, it looks how can he bypass the competition and how do you bypass the competition? So let's say this monkey is actually lighter and has a longer tail and it can jump faster between branches and hence it can, it can go to the top of the tree where the bigger, fatter monkey cannot do and there on the top of the tree it can feed off the fruit alone. So now he's using his relative advantage which is his, his long tail to get further away from the competition. So what happens? He gets more food by investing less effort. And that's the secret sauce. That's the secret sauce of life. Avoid 
fighting by developing a niche. Okay? Because if you develop a niche, there's nobody there to fight with you. So that means you can get easier to your real goal, which is survival. So now you have much, much more time, free resources for leisure. We go back to humanity now. So take it back to humanity. Competition, a lot of effort, a lot of money, a lot of responses, a lot of resources are spent not on getting your target, but fighting somebody on the way to, to, to your target. Okay? If you, instead of that, look at your relative advantage and you invest yourself in that, just like the species in the forest, through innovation, you find a way where you can avoid competition by creating an advantage, by innovating something and creating a niche that has no competition. If you manage to create that niche, you have no competition. What happens when you have no competition? Resources are freed, less effort. And secondly, yields are increasing. You can take much more now. Like if you have a monopoly, you can increase the price. You increase the price, your yields are bigger. Your effort is lesser. So now you have free resources. With these free resources, you can now do things. You can invest in your team. You can invest in society. You can invest in the environment. And you can invest in R&D so you keep the relative advantage and you keep your monopoly. This is actually the secret of nature because by avoiding competition, you create synergy. In nature, everything lives in... Seems like we lost him. Yeah, I, he froze for me as well. Um, it happened once before, but not quite so long. Let's see. Yeah. Okay, he's still he's still in there. Okay, well, will we wait for um, Yossi, hopefully, to unfreeze and join back to us? I'll just recap what I'm understanding um, about um, his business applications from what he learned, um, and you guys can go ahead and reinforce that with me. Um, I think the first thing looks like he dropped out. Hopefully, he'll come back in with us. There he comes. Um, the first thing I'm understanding is that. Hi, Yossi. Hi. Hi. Perfect. I was just recapping for our audience what we learned from you while we were waiting for you to come back on air. Um, our understanding is that um, the two main principles that we're getting from you as far as applying nature to business would be that competition is actually a good thing, contrary to what um, we might be taught or understand, because it establishes you, um, forces you to be at your peak, to be at your best. And then also the need for a business to have focus, to have that vision, the idea of not wasting your energy um, on, on the competition, so to speak, but just to make yourself better and to find um, your relative advantage and, and your niche um, in that. Um, did I get that about right? Perfect. Perfect. Um, so I was wondering, um, you were going back, um, you mentioned something about um, uh, choosing your teams as part of a vision. And I think this is something that Nearsoft does really well. Um, our hiring process is very intense and we make sure that those of us who we want, who want, we want to be our team members really fit into our culture, fit into our vision. The idea that it's a lot easier, I think, to um, teach somebody a task than it is to um, change the core of a person. And so I understand um, you had uh, started a startup called Blink, and it's a really interesting story in talking with you. Um, you actually built your team out of um, Palestinian developers, is that correct? And I'm just wondering if you could maybe highlight a bit of like how that team was developed and what type of process you use as an entrepreneur to um, find your, your relative advantage with the people that you choose to work with. Yeah. Well... You know, first of all, in terms of entrepreneur, as I say, my main uh, 
quality is, you know, the ability to be a naive dreamer. And because na naivete is very important for an entrepreneur. Otherwise, you know, like, because if you start something and you don't dream big and you don't dare, so you need this child-like quality to dream big and to believe you can achieve it. It's naive, you know, so that naivete is important because if you're skeptic and cynical, then uh, you cannot also dream big. And so this is one thing that I brought as, you know, I brought the vision to the company and I thought to myself at the same time, why limit the vision? I always was uh, involved in grassroots uh, reconciliation here in the Middle East. So what we did, me and my partner, we just said, uh, I told him, let's do that. And he agreed, said, let's uh, look for our developers uh, in the Palestinian um, um, Authority and not in, you know, outsource to Ukraine or to Eastern Europe or to India, but actually stay in the Middle East. But instead of outsourcing, we struck a partnership. We insisted to give equity um, to the developers. And they were very impressed because we just went to meet them in Ramallah. And they said that never happened. They cooperated with Israelis before, but never the Israelis came knocking on their door in Ramallah. And so they had respect for us for doing that. And we hired in, you know, five developers and, and worked with them on, on two mobile uh, applications. And it was very interesting because our mobile application was all about creating a, an identity, a digital identity, which is consolidated. And in other words, you could see a, a whole digital identity because we would funnel all communication channels to one platform and all social networks to one platform. So in one place you can have a thread and you can have a feed which was a meta social graph. All the, all the uh, social media and all communication. And we were working with these developers so obviously we saw each other also in this app and then the war uh, broke. This was about two, three years ago when the uh, last war broke in, in Gaza and this was our tragedy as well because, uh, you know, it was very hard uh, not to be affected uh, by, by the violence and we could see what each other think because we would see each other Facebook and Twitter and it was quite an amazing uh, circumstances. Unfortunately, it also broke the partnership because we couldn't go to Ramallah anymore and they couldn't come to Tel Aviv anymore. We went like 10 years back because of that last war. Um, and before that war, we would just drive and just be at home in Ramallah. But after the war, our partners told us, do not come, do not come, it's not safe anymore. Um, but I would say, uh, that we made uh, friends and that we, 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 we had a daring vision and we acted upon it and you know my vision was like to develop this much further and to actually bring entrepreneurship because that's the strong uh, trait of Israel is a very um, uh, entrepreneurial and I wanted us to not only use the engineering power but also bring that spirit of entrepreneurship to Palestine um, and I really believe, uh, still believe in the peace process and I'm still working on it now on a different way but uh, it's still part of my life. What was that transition for you like going from like the ecology side what you did with Chalalan as well as I understand helping expand the reserves is like a Medidi forest I believe um, in Bolivia and then to find yourself doing startups and software development um, what was that transition like for you those passions? Um, it doesn't really matter uh, to me because I've done many different things uh, in my life uh, and, and um, what for me is like I never work 
you know, it's not, because whatever I do, I don't consider work. It's my life. I'm fully engaged. I always do what I want. It's always like, uh, you know, as a purpose to it and a dream, and I fully engage myself in it. And that's why I don't feel any difference. You know, I move from one thing to another, but actually the quality of what I do never changes. And I, I you know, I'm always working. I'm always doing things. I'm always busy. I always owe to my computer. There's always a list of things that my computer wants me to do for it. I'm always behind. And I don't have time. I don't play. I don't have hobbies. I don't play golf. I don't play chess. You know, I'm just always. Why? Because I'm passionate. Why? Because I'm involved. Why? Because I'm engaged. So it really doesn't matter what I do. As to the different fields, I call myself a professional unprofessional, which means I'm a good professional. The unprofessional means I, I bring, when I don't know something, which means I'm not a professional in this field, my professional side learns it. Because I think that what's important today is not what you know, but actually your ability to learn. What you know doesn't really matter because it's yesterday's news, what you know. Knowledge is not that important anymore. The ability to learn and to assimilate, that's important because, you know, like in technology, things change so fast, you need to learn the next thing, not only learn, assimilate, implement, and let go as well. So not to hold on to your knowledge, I know this, this, you know, things are so dynamic today. So if I take pride in anything is that I'm not afraid of learning something new. I'm not scared of, of learning. I'm not scared of terminology. And, and so, I mean, I was, I treated the opiate addicts for seven years. And I had to learn everything about the science of opiate addiction because as a lay person speaking to doctors and psychiatrists and 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 uh, drug and alcohol professionals I needed to know more than them for them to respect me as a lay person so I learned uh, my biggest enlightenment in the rainforest came from reading a scientific article that actually was a table that explained that the economic value of renewable resources is much greater than the economic value of non-renewable resources. That's what actually brought Chalalan to life because understanding this idea made me write a three-pager, fly to Washington DC with it, and based on this three-pager, on this idea that sustainable development is a better strategy than conservation, since this was a, a timely idea in the early 90s, I raised the money for my project in one single meeting that I arranged from a phone booth with yellow pages, you know. So again, it's the passion, it's the naivete, and, and as I said in the beginning, dreaming is not enough if you sit on your in your living room and keep on dreaming. That's called escapism, yeah. Dreaming as a vision, as a blueprint of reality, is putting yourself out there, risking and knowing that nothing comes without resistance. And not succumbing to the resistance, but, you know, being strong and loyal to your vision. And then again, doing something that is unique, because all that passion and vision would never be invested in something that is competitive, like, oh, he's doing it, how come, let's put all my passion and all that, you know, to leverage on his market and steal from him his market, you know. I don't find in it no passion and, and no purpose and I cannot be engaged. Yet most of what we do is exactly that. We don't innovate. We just try to see, oh, this is a good market. Let's get into this market. It's very silly because by getting into a market with competitors, you're not doing anything new. Uh, you're not at your peak performance, and you're lowering the yields, you're increasing the effort. Just a, But we are addicted to our beliefs. So as long as we keep on moving based on these paradigms of we live in scarcity, we have to struggle, and we have to, you know, fight and win. 
win means somebody else has to lose. Those are wrong old ideas. We have to rid ourselves of those ideas. And I think that the world of technology is beautiful because it's all based on innovation. It's all based on, 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 on uh, you know, research and development. And that's why, for me, I admire the technology. I believe that technology is what will save us because no matter what happens, technology doesn't slow down. It keeps on pushing forward. And I believe with all the bad things that we did, technology is actually going to save us. I believe we're going to saw the holes in the ozone. We're going to clean our oceans and our rivers. We're going to heal the earth. And we're going to feed the masses. And all that will do is technology. So I think technology is the Messiah. <laughs> Very good. Um, we're getting ready to um, wrap up our session today, our hours quickly, too quickly, I think, coming to a close. Um, Matt, uh, Clemol, anything that you'd like um, to ask Yossi or um, final words? Please. Yeah, the, the only thing I could say is uh, I'm, I'm blown away. I mean, a lot of what you said is matches right in line with our philosophy of how we run the company, what, how it came together, and all those things. And in fact, when I heard about you're using developers in um, in, in Ramallah, I thought, yeah. oh, that's, that's brilliant, because I had never thought of that. Um, and uh, it's like right there in front of you, and you don't see it. But I mean, t just about everything else is almost everything else that you said we're, we're quite in line with. The, right. the part about Darwin we can talk about a little bit more, but, <laughs> but other than that, it's, uh, I think you're, you're right on the spot. And uh, it, it's not, I wouldn't call it naivete, by the way. At some point it becomes wisdom. Yeah. So, I mean, naivete is when you really don't know anything. When you keep doing it in spite of what you do know, that's wisdom. Thank you. I, I accept this. That's right. That's right. Thank you, Matt. I, I appreciate it, and I love to discuss further, um, so we can we can look at the, the Darwinian ideas that I think are very dangerous, and go go deeper because I think that our intelligence is amazing, but we have like our belief is actually what creates the world, and as long as we have this old belief. You know, we are we are victims of ourselves. For example, poverty on this planet. We know that the planet is abundant enough to feed all of us, mm -hmm. and you know. But the old idea is that if the poor is not going to be poor, then the rich is going to be less rich, which is not true. Right. If the poor is not going to be poor, the rich is going to get richer. Yeah. It's not that money is limited and if the poor will have more, the rich will have less. No, money is actually very important, as we said, because there's no hunting gathering today, so we need money. But the moment you have money, there's only one thing you can do with it. Only one thing you can do with money, and this thing is spend it. It's impossible not to spend money. There's nothing that you can do to avoid spending, because saving is also a product. So even saving is buying a product of somebody. So no matter what you do, you spend the money. If you spend money, the economy grows. So if the poor is not poor, the richer is going to get richer. But we don't think that. As if it's our interest of the, you know, like the richer people not to have. And we don't see the wisdom of nature that the world is interconnected. Mm -hmm. And interdependent. So we think if you know if the Somalis are dying of uh, hunger, well, you know, poor thing. It's not just a thing, you know. There's pirate pirates, and there's Al Qaeda. You know, these are all related to poverty and injustice. So you know, we have to see that it's only one system, and because it's a closed system. If we don't care, take care of each other, it's just counter-effective. Yeah. And you're it's about all of us. That's the revolution, revolution. Yeah. It's about all of us. And your point about scarcity and, and it being a, a ghost, really, from, from years past is red and button, too. So. Thank you. Thank you.
My pleasure. Um, Clément? Clément? Well, I'm, I'm very, very amazed about the way uh, you make a connection and the link between um, uh, the, the nature about uh, what was on Earth bef before you, we would get in intelligent, you know, and uh, the new technologies. Because usually, you know, we associate the idea that uh, a new technology is something that, that's going to contaminate and uh, uh, that is uh, against uh, something natural in the sense of, of uh, the Mother Earth, you know. So I very, very love the way you create that connection and, and you show the, the, the integration of what we do uh, in terms of, of technology and innovation uh, with uh, the respect of the nature. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, look, it's amazing, but still, you know, like in terms of our technology, it takes its, its, its uh, most of it is coming from nature. Uh, you look at the pharmacology, still the source of new medicine is mainly nature. It's not the scientists make molecules in laboratory and they find disease. No, they synthesize or harvest natural the, the 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 innovation in nature is still far far ahead of us it's all the secret source of life is innovation because innovation create monopoly monopoly means non competition non competition means less effort higher yields that's how nature works it works through innovation each species making amazing innovations just to separate itself from direct competition and everybody thrives in that environment. If we just learn that, just invest in innovation. Investing in innovation will give us an advantage. Advantage will give us a monopoly. Monopoly will mean we'll make bigger profits. It's all ironic because this way is actually actually easier and makes more profit. And still, it, it, it heals the planet and the world. So it just, you know. I wish we have an awakening, but uh, it's right there, you know. The Amazon is the best teacher for that because it's so not true to think that it's a struggle. The competition in the Amazon is not a struggle. There's lots of leisure in the Amazon. Species in the Amazon don't work so hard to get the food because they're so, you know, like the dense populations. There's plenty. Even on the busiest place on the planet, it's very abundant. No species goes hungry. There's plenty for all of them, and there's lots of leisure for all of them. And the Amazonian people, by the way, before the missionaries came, they were playing in the forest. You know, they would go hunt on expeditions. They would chew all kinds of nice leaves, such as ayahuasca, and lick some toads. They had all kinds of spiritual awakenings. And, you know, it wasn't about hard work, and they never harvested more than they needed. So those things are together. Nature is technology. Perfect. Um, again, I mean, truly, you'll see, I think the pleasure has been ours. Um, I would like to let people know, I believe your, your handle on Twitter is Yossi underscore Ginsberg, for those of you who um, are interested in following up on him a little bit more. Um, Yossi, can you quickly again tell us um, the titles of your books, if people want to purchase those as well? And it looks like, um, hold on one second, I think I have a question for you. Um, I'm not sure if it's a question for me or a question for you, but um, go ahead and tell us the titles of your books again, please. Oh. Um, thank you, Kim. Um, the titles are Django, and then the second book is called The Laws of the Jungle. Okay, perfect. Um, and then... Um, uh, your movie's coming out in, in January, is that correct? Is he frozen? Okay. 
okay. Well, I think um, he's frozen up a bit there. Yes, my understanding is the movie Jungle starring Daniel Radcliffe telling Yossi's story to Daniel Radcliffe is portraying him. Comes out in January, so be able to catch that in theaters, everyone. And then um, catch Yossi on Twitter as well as his website, which is www.ginsburg. Com. And then, once again, um, thank you for joining us at Doja Live today. Um, oh, this is our season finale for season one. We'll be starting up again um, in October. Um, but keep checking us out at dojo.nearsoft.com. And um, we'll see you soon. Um, so thank you, everyone, and have a great, great rest of the day. Um, Matt, Clement, thank you for your time as well. And um, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank bye you. bye. Oh, bye. Finalized trans.